Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Brian Curtis, along with Doug Krisner. Join us each day for the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Russian President Vladimir Putin is in Vietnam, keen to maintain the long-standing military ties between Moscow and Hanoi. Uh, let's take a closer look now with our own John Herskovitz, Bloomberg East Asia government editor, who joins us from our studios in Tokyo. So, uh, Mr. Putin is just off uh, a visit to uh, North Korea now in uh, Vietnam. John, w- what type of uh, welcome has he received? What do we know? Well, he's received warm welcomes in both places. Um, North Korea went out of its way to show its uh, appreciation and enthusiasm for the Putin trip, and Vietnam has done the same. The Vietnam end of the t- uh, start of the tour is going to uh, the official things are going to be starting uh, in a few hours. North Korea is over and done, and it was a pretty significant. Uh, a visit for Putin. Um, there was the defense, mutual defense deal that came about. And also this likely strengthened the uh, arms trade between North Korea and Russia. North Korea has been suspected of sending millions of artillery shells to Russia for its war in Ukraine. And uh, the two have had the deepened cooperation since Russia's full-scale of invasion, full-scale invasion of Ukraine about two years ago. So Putin in, in Vietnam, I mean, that relationship was um, was long sort of predicated on, you know, his historical connections and, and uh, Vietnam relied on Russia for weapons. I take it that that has slowed down a lot of late because Vietnam is is trying not to anger the West too much. Um, if we t- talk a little bit about that and also what Vietnam uh, offers to Russia. Yeah, I, um the trade weapons has slowed down. Vietnam is worried about uh, sanctions from the West if it cooperates too much with Russia in terms of secure, uh, security and armaments. But uh, the one thing that has gone on with Russia and Vietnam is uh, energy cooperation. Um, just before um, uh, Putin arrived, uh, uh, Russia's uh, Novatech uh, said it plans uh, LNG projects in the um, in Vietnam, they're looking at cooperation in wind power development, and it helps to have a powerful friend in Russia, especially with um, the the uh, tensions in the South China Sea. Um, if you have Russia's support with China being more assertive in the region, it, it makes Vietnam stand a little bit more assured in its uh, explorations in the region. John, you and I both know how Vietnam has transformed itself into somewhat of a a manufacturing economy. Is this something that Russia can take advantage of? Um, I think it's something that they're going to look towards. Uh, But Vietnam is just, uh, it has concerns uh, from the West, uh, like the um, many firms look at a China plus one for manufacturing, uh, plants in China and plants in Vietnam. So you'll see it it has global, it has global players uh, in the country now doing manufacturing. Russia is one of them. But uh, one thing to keep in mind when it comes to Russia's economic capacity, capability, is that it's not that big of a country. I think the uh, GDP for Texas is bigger than that of Russia's. So there are a lot of players in Vietnam. Russia is one of them, but it's probably down the list uh, compared to some of the other major economies that are in the country. So it sort of begs the question, why did Putin go to Vietnam? Uh, Putin, this overall trip is showing a renewed focus from Russia into Asia. And uh, Putin has only a few allies, and he's turning to those that have been traditionally part of the Soviet bloc, um, a Soviet that were aligned during the Soviet Union, North Korea and Vietnam. And both have their own interests. For Kim Jong-un, it's uh, support for the economy, support for his uh, weapons and technology ambitions. For Vietnam, it increases the size of the Russian card that they can play as they seek a balance between China, the U.S., the West, Japan, 
and Russia. When we last spoke to you uh, about uh, Putin's visit to North Korea, you and I were talking a little bit about uh, Beijing's reaction to this trip on the part of Putin. What's your sense of how Beijing views uh, the visit to Vietnam? It makes things more complicated for Beijing. Um, the interest in the South China Sea with energy are something that's going to be a little bit more difficult to uh, carry out. Beijing's ambitions will maybe a little bit more difficult to carry out. And also, Vietnam and China have their security uh, difficulties. With Russia stepping up and getting closer to Vietnam, it makes things a little bit more problematic for China. You mentioned about a Russia card that Vietnam kind of wants to keep that in its back pocket. Is there much of a card there? Uh, it's it's good to have. I mean, um, when you're exploring in the South China Sea, knowing that if there are Chinese patrol boats around, that you may have a friend uh, in the region who could come to help. It's something to keep in mind. Yeah. <laughs> We'll leave it there. John, thank you so much for being with us. John Herskowitz, uh, Bloomberg East Asia government editor, joining from Tokyo here on Daybreak Asia as we look at Russian President Putin's visit to Vietnam. Well, it appears as though a trade war is well underway in the market for electric vehicles. From the China side, car makers have urged Beijing to adopt a tax of 25% on European-made cars with large internal combustion engines. This is in response to Brussels applying tariffs on Chinese EVs. And stateside, we have the Biden administration announcing new levies on Chinese EVs. Let's take a closer look at the story with Stephen Dyer. He is a co-leader of Alex Partners Greater China Business. He's also the head of uh, Asia Automotive Practice. Stephen, thank you for joining us. This is obviously early innings, or so it would appear. I mean, how bad could this get potentially? Well, we're seeing now the ratcheting up of tit for tat uh, tariffs, which one might expect in these situations. Um, at this point, uh, it seems that the tariffs from Europe may have stabilized. Uh, they took intermediate measures, not as uh, extreme as the U.S. did. So we'll have to wait and see if that changes. It's an interesting environment when you think about some things. Uh, for instance, the Chinese economy has been doing pretty poorly over the past uh, two to three years. And yet the Chinese EV market has grown faster than anywhere in the world. Um, China doesn't really sell many uh, electric vehicles in the United States. So you could say, well, do they really need the United States? Uh, of course, they would like to sell in the United States, uh, but it's it sort of you've got this uh, environment here where people are turning their back on globalization. Uh, countries are hunkering down, whether it's because of jobs or because of income or nationalism. Uh, it means we go in a different direction, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that is dire. Well, the Chinese auto market is the largest in the world and almost as big as the European and the US auto market combined. So certainly with domestic demand in China, um, there's sufficient demand to support a number of Chinese electric vehicle makers, but not all of them. Um, so uh, for it's also a very competitive market. There's been an ongoing price war on the electric vehicle industry in China for a year and a half now that's gotten quite extreme. And so uh, many Chinese firms want to go abroad for a couple of reasons. One is to get into uh, sort of bluer waters, if you will, competitively, mm -hmm. where they can charge higher prices. Uh, and secondly, uh, it's another source of growth. And then thirdly, it's also a, a a mark of prestige in China, their home market, if they can successfully sell their vehicles outside of China. So, Stephen, markets. do I hear you saying that, that there really is an overcapacity issue, particularly in the EV space that China is going to have to deal with at, at some point? I mean, a lot of the companies would not be able to survive, would it not, were it not for a lot of government support? I mean, is there still uh, going to be some level of contraction when you look at the EV market in China? Well, there are 137 EV brands that have sold at least one vehicle uh, this year in China. And Alex Partners, in a recent analysis, estimated that maybe 20 of them long term will be viable, just given the, the volume and the structure of the industry. Uh, so that means uh, the rest of them will have to have patient investors with deep pockets, uh, but eventually there will be consolidation. 
And we just reported this morning uh, that Chinese car makers uh, are urging Beijing to crack down hard on European uh, uh, cars with large engines, and they want a, a tariff of 25 percent. Um, I wonder what what that does uh, to the relationship between Europe and China. Can, can it get uh, I guess it can go down a little bit, can it? Yeah, it's certainly not a good thing for the relationship, but it's to be expected in these cases. Uh, typically, you'll have some response uh, in these trade wars. Um, so the the European tariffs are definitely an obstacle for Chinese EV makers, uh, some more than others. Uh, it's a mix of tariffs, and, and at the lower end, uh, some of the OEMs may still be able to export profitably to Europe, even under those tariff conditions especially if they pass on some to the consumers. But it probably will just accelerate the localization of Chinese EV maker assembly into Europe. And there are many companies uh, currently pursuing that, just as the Japanese and the Korean automakers did back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s in the U.S., just to get around tariffs. What about Chinese manufacturers looking to the global south, whether it is uh, South America, even Australia? I mean, is that uh, potentially a strategy? Uh, yes, the Chinese automakers are very active in South America and uh, to a certain extent in Australia, but a little less so. Um, those are not the biggest markets, uh, so it'll be incremental, uh, but definitely uh, many Chinese EV makers are pursuing and will continue to pursue uh, opportunities in the south of the, of the globe. Can you see China using the Mexico route to get cars into the U.S.? Well, that's been the plan uh, up until now, and, and currently it still looks like uh, some automakers are planning to set up assembly in Mexico to get into the U.S. and Canada eventually. Um, we'll see if those policies in the U.S. change uh, in the next six months, which they might to target, uh, you know, specifically Chinese invested companies. That's problematic from a practical standpoint because it's hard to say, well, to what extent is a, is a Chinese investment important? Yeah. All right, Stephen, uh, thanks very much. We know that President Trump has vowed uh, to try to uh, attack that plan. Stephen Dyer there, he's the Greater China Business Head of Automotive Practice. Our guest in our studios in Hong Kong is Philip Batshi, Chief Investment Officer and Head of Investment Management at Bank J. Safra Saracen. Philip, thank you very much for coming in to join us here on the program. So at the moment, the themes in the marketplace seem to be the AI growth story, uh, pretty solid economic data, and easing inflation. That all seems to be keeping a little bit more risk on than risk off in markets. Do you think that continues and what might change it? Yes, thanks for, for being here. I, I think it uh, continues, and that's why we remain fundamentally bullish uh, because of these uh, uh, trends that you have just mentioned. But I think it might be a bit on the, the verge of sort of a, a, an inflection point, where particularly on the economic side, we will see some weaker data in the second half of the year. So the trends on, on AI certainly continue. I think in terms of earnings, they will be good in the short term. But uh, in the second half of the year, we might run into some some issues there and uh, therefore our case is that we are uh, still bullish but a bit less so than before. Philip, I'm curious about the leading indicators you're looking at in order to arrive at the, the conclusion that data is going to kind of roll over and become a little soft. The labor market in the States is holding up well. Uh, the manufacturing economy seems to be doing pretty well as well. I mean, there was a soft reading on retail sales last week. If that's what you're looking at, maybe I can understand. But I, I, can you expound a little bit about your thinking in terms of forecasting economic weakness? Yes, of course. In, in terms of the U.S., I mean, we were hoping that manufacturing uh, activity would actually pick up, and it has done so in, at the start of the year. We have seen a number of indicators moving higher, sort of there was a uh, positive momentum building. But then uh, last month's uh, ISM manufacturing data was actually quite weak. New orders were plunging back into contraction. And so this uh, whole story that actually manufacturing can pick up, I think it's a bit sort of uh, in, in doubt. On the 
the consumer side, you mentioned retail sales, but also if you look at overall trends, I mean, the consumer has been resilient, but we think that it will sort of run out of uh, savings soon and that probably the second half of the year will be a bit, bit uh, tougher for consumption and that it might fade. On the labor market as well, I mean, we have seen some uh, very positive news, but sort of the underlying trends in terms of job openings, in terms of also jobless claims, which have uh, recently uh, moved uh, higher, uh, they're not all uh, on the positive side. But we're not speaking about the economy falling off a cliff. We're not forecasting a recession, but just yeah. kind of the trend of surprises turning probably into some disappointments. So do you think then that central banks are looking a little bit too much in the rearview mirror when they say they're data dependent and they should be looking more? at what you're looking at, early indicators that Doug mentioned as well, and perhaps start tweaking a little. Yeah, I think that that is the case. And uh, we have seen that in, in Europe to some extent. I mean, we have seen the ECB starting to cut rates. We have seen the Swiss National Bank, they're actually meeting today, later today again, and uh, might also do another rate cut, basically looking at sort of the, the weakening economy. What we see is that interest rate uh, hikes of the last two, two years, they are impacting the economy, but only very, very slowly. And so we think that it will uh, take some time, particularly in the US as well. But uh, central banks should probably start now to reduce a bit uh, the, the the restrictive policy in order to avoid uh, too much of a slowdown. So will that accommodation be the driver for equity markets going forward, or will the markets become more concerned about the quality of earnings going forward, and maybe we're due for some type of corrective, uh, corrective behavior? Well, I think it's a bit of both. I think on the one hand, uh, I think that the next few months could well continue to deliver some positive surprises on the inflation side, also kind of reuniting uh, hopes for more rate cuts to come. But when growth actually softens, I think also the market could uh, become a bit worried about the earnings uh, side of, of things. And uh, therefore, uh, some type of correction is, is quite likely at some point. But we're not expecting the market to kind of uh, fall uh, dramatically. I mean, it could uh, create a bit more volatility is quite likely. We have also the, the U.S. presidential election coming up. But we still expect the market to be sort of at a similar level or even slightly higher at the end of the year. But in the meantime, volatility is higher. So if you're looking at whether you want to add risk at some point, you probably can buy the market a bit lower than today. Philip, because of competitive pressures, uh, most managers probably have to be, uh, to a certain degree, exposed to artificial intelligence and the TSMCs and, and NVIDIAs of the world. So how do you actually uh, reduce positions here and diversify uh, to protect yourself without killing returns? Well, I think, I think we are quite positive or optimistic about these uh, big leaders like NVIDIA. You, you mentioned um, we, are, we are, have a positive view on, on the stock. So it's not necessarily that we want to uh, kind of go underweight or reduce those market leaders, because as long as the market is going up, I think it will continue to be led by these, uh, these names. So if you want to take off the risk, I think rather than diversify, is, is probably you take off kind of overall the market level risk that you have, you do that by, for, for example, uh, uh, buying some put options or, or, or via futures, but not necessarily by uh, taking off the risk to large cap names. We think large cap leadership will uh, continue. It's also driven a lot by passive investing, which obviously uh, is a booster of this momentum trade. Mm. And Philip, I see that you are adding to your investment grade bonds with the two to five year uh, duration. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us and for sharing your, your ideas. He is Philip Batshi, who is Chief Investment Officer, Head of Investment Management at Bank, J. Safra Saracen. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere else you listen, and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal, and the Bloomberg Business App.